Matthew chapter 12, you go there with me, the gospel according to Matthew. And we certainly have been blessed. We've had more light than any nation ever in the world has. God's been so good. And uh, may we not neglect that light. May we not forget. It is interesting to talk to immigrants, people that came from places where they didn't have freedom, and said, even still, there's no greater nation on the earth. And that's not people born in America saying, that's people that have come to America. Because they want to be here, because you're free to do what you want to do. We've enjoyed that. May we not neglect it. God's been so good. Oh, may we have the privilege to see our country turn to God again. That's not going to happen from the White House or a State House. It's going to happen as you and I from the church house go out bearing that precious seed. Our Fisherman's Club group is memorizing this week. He that goeth forth and weepeth. Oh, Lord, give us tears again for the lost souls dropping into hell. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And there's people that you know that I may never meet. There's people that you're going to come across that I would never have the privilege of speaking to, that God wants to use you as that light, as, as that witness. And what a privilege. I'm glad we don't carry the news that Jonah had to carry or, or that some of these other prophets, judgment's coming and you know some of that. Man, that was rough stuff. But we say, God loves you. You're a sinner. You deserve hell. But Jesus paid the penalty. Oh, he's got a gift he wants to give you. It's eternal life. It comes through Jesus. Would you receive the Lord Jesus? Take him. He's the greatest friend. He's a wonderful Savior. And he'll save you today. He'll never leave you. Never say. I mean, what a message we bear. May God help us to tell it. There's lots of bad news to talk about, and we've all complained about coronavirus and all the things we don't agree with about certain things, and we've all had that, I'm sure. But boy, what a good news we could bring, a good word to folks, and may God help us to do it. Well, we're here in Matthew again. We've been studying this book, and I've enjoyed it. I hope you never get tired of studying the life of the Lord Jesus. And uh, really, as John says, we can never exhaust what the Lord did uh, while he was here on this earth and, and, the, and these men, his public ministry these three and a half years. But we give, again, a reminder that Matthew is not laying out in chronological order the events of the Lord's life, but rather he is presenting a case, almost like a, an attorney might present a case. And he's presenting it to his Jewish counterparts, the Jewish people, saying, here's the king, here's the one you prayed for. And every day they would pray that the day would be the day the Messiah would come. And here he is, the king has come. So what powerful news he was sharing. He's trying to present this case and he gives his, his precepts as he gives the Sermon on the Mount. No greater, no greater passage of Scripture than Jesus' message than the Sermon on the Mount. And then he shows his power in chapter 8 and 9 over disease, over death, over, over, over demons, all this. We see his power. And then now he is continuing on as we've looked in this study as presenting the case as the Messiah King, but now they've rejected him. And we saw the shift there in chapter 11 as the Lord Jesus turns not to the nation, but to the individual says, come unto me. Come to me. All the labor, I'll give you rest. And here we're going to see even twice in this passage mentioned about the Gentiles. And uh, Matthew 15, 6 says this. We're going to read Matthew 12, but just a couple chapters further, he's going to say, the Lord Jesus says, Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Can you imagine? There's churches happening right now, today, online, different ones, that because of their tradition, they've totally crowded God out of the church, crowded Christ out of the church. God said it was not, this isn't something new. It was happening in their day. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Think of that. That's what's going on here in chapter 12. We're going to see it. See, for the Jew, the Sabbath and circumcision were what made Jew a Jew a Jew. I mean, that was their two sacred cows, if you will. Don't mess with the Sabbath. Don't mess with circumcision. That was the thing uh, for them that made a Jew a Jew. There was no other nation that gave one day out of seven uh, to worship God. And, and so it made them special, if you will. But they had totally changed God's purpose and intent for the Sabbath and turned it on its head. Made it something that was instead of a blessing, a burden. God gave it to man as a blessing. Aren't you glad you don't have to work seven days a week? God gave it as a blessing. And they'd made it a burden. And so that's what we see in Matthew 12. Let's begin in verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, probably wheat here, and his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn to eat. 
But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, I love the Lord Jesus here. Have ye not read what David did when he was a hungered and they that were with him? How he entered in the house of God and did eat the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That they might accuse him. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it, lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath days? Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth. And hallelujah, it was restored whole like as the other. Like sometimes we read over stuff like that, and we don't let it sink in. This guy's hand was, I don't know what was wrong. Boom was healed. Then the Pharisees went out and had a counsel against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. And charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, and my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I'll put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment into mercy, unto mercy. And in his name, what a name, and in his name, Shall the Gentiles trust? There may be a Jewish person here this morning, but I would dare say the vast majority of us, if not all, are Gentiles. Aren't you glad that in his name we've been able to trust? Praise the Lord for that. Well, I want to bring you a message this morning. The title is a question. Will your heart be hardened or humbled by this king? Oh, we see this right here in this passage. Will your heart be hardened or humbled? By this king. You know, in reality, when anyone sees Christ for who he is, there's only two options. Either one, you humble, we humble ourselves before him. What a God. I mean, Isaiah saw him high and lifted up, and the power of the place shook because of the strength and power of Almighty God. You hear people say foolish things like, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God. No, you won't. We'll bow before him. The Bible says every mouth will be stopped. You're not going to stand before God and accuse him. He's so great, so mighty to think that he cares at all for us. What a loving, wonderful Savior. What a God we have. There's only two options. Either one, you humble. We humble ourselves before him. We bow. We take our proper posture. Or we harden our hearts toward him. Really, that's true for every time you hear the word of God. Remember Jesus' parable? The sower went to sow. What happened? There was these hard hearts. Why was it hard? Because the Bible either hardens a heart or it takes root and it grows and produces fruit. Today, if you'll submit to God, you'll yield to Him. You won't be stiff-necked or like Pharaoh that hardened his heart. You'll become more like the Lord. He'll work in your life. Being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. He is not looking at everyone else. He's looking at you this morning. And he's at work in your life. What a Savior. What a God. So I don't know the Lord. Well, he's looking at you, saying, I died for you. I took your sin. Oh, come to me. He that cometh to me, I'll know why it's cast out. He'll save you today. But he's interested in your life. But when we say no, we grieve the Spirit. We say no, we eventually quench the Spirit. We put him out. We get hard 
Some of you hadn't heard the voice of God. You've been away from church, away from some of that iron, that sharpened iron, that good Christian fellowship. And, and because of that, you've started to quench. You've started to put out things. You've allowed sin in your life. And the Spirit's not dealing with you like He once was. In your private worship, that most important worship, that secret place, that home worship every day with God. And you, you haven't sensed Him or known Him in that place. And, and even this morning, unless you, unless you are very careful, you may miss the Lord today. You say, I was in church. That's wonderful. You can be in church and miss the Lord. You can be in church and miss out on the worship. You can sit here and think about something else or snooze or do something. We've all done it. But God is waiting if you would turn to Him. If you'd look to Him today, He is waiting to work in your life. That's the kind of Savior you have. What will be my response? What would be yours? As we study chapter 7, my prayer is we get a more wonderful and beautiful picture of Jesus. Oh, may we be humbled. May we stand in awe of our Lord and what we see in Jesus here. Let's pray together. Father, help us now. Lord, you know I need the help. Father, that I would be removed from the equation that your spirit would have full control. You're the true preacher. This is your word. Would you deliver the message with the same spirit, the same tenor, the same tone, Lord, that we would hear from you. And that you would be pleased and honored and glorified. We'll praise you. Do what only you can do. If there's a lost one here today, oh, I know heaven's waiting to rejoice at any sinner that would come to repentance. And Father, may you draw them. For all of us that are saved, please, dear Lord, do the work in our lives. We need all we need it. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We looked at several portraits in chapter 11 of the Lord Jesus. In chapter 12, we'll see six more portraits of Jesus Christ. We'll just look at two of them this morning. But there's six here. Chapter 11, 12 kind of are connected, kind of like chapters 8 and 9 are in Matthew. And so we're confronted as we look at these portraits with this ultimate question, are you for or against Jesus? There's no middle ground. He is a controversial subject. I'll tell you, your flesh is an enmity even still with him. It doesn't like it because you have to yield. If you want your way, your way is not God's way. I'm going to just tell you, I've been saved 28 years. Here I am the pastor. My way is still not God's way. My way is this place. The way of man is right in his own eyes, but the end thereof is what? The ways of death. My way, I have to die every day to it. I have to yield to God. And so it's true with all of us, isn't it? And Paul said, I have to die daily to my way. So God, give us your way today. I want to be for, I want to be walking in step with you. Number one, we'll see this picture. Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. He is Lord of the Sabbath. Verses 1 to 14, we already read. It's shocking what happens here to me. I mean, you can just imagine. If we were here today, and and I don't know, someone withered hands. We have some people that have some arthritis and different things. But someone had to, uh, Brother Ralph had a bite by a spider, right? A brown recluse got him. And a big spot on his. Someone maybe had something made worse than that. Maybe it was all shriveled up and was just... You've seen people's arms that they couldn't use and they lost all muscle and it was just a bone almost in skin. And, and all of a sudden, the Lord was here and God said, stretch out your hand. He didn't even touch him. I mean, he did the least amount of work possible. He didn't even do anything. He just said, stretch it out. You read all the passages I did. The Bible didn't say anywhere that he touched him. He just stretched out his hand in faith. And when he did, he was restored whole. I mean, the reaction of everybody here, at least I think, I know mine would be, Woo! I mean, can you believe that? Wow! Pray, I've never seen it like that. I mean, have you? I certainly haven't. I mean, that would be the natural reaction. But verse 14 boggles my mind. Here are people that are so religious, so power hungry, they've been blinded, that something good happens to someone. And they, their reaction is murder. Their reaction is let's destroy him. That's what verse 14 says. It doesn't just say, let's get rid of this guy. Let's see if we can... Let's destroy him. I mean, think of that towards God. That's the attitude of the devil, certainly. That's the attitude of those that are against God. Let's destroy him. What? How is murder your reaction to this? This is an awesome miracle of mercy. But to understand what's going on, we have to get a little bit into the mind of the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. Certainly these Pharisees. They believe that obedience to the law was how you earned favor with God. They fell into the trap of every religion in the world outside of knowing the Lord Jesus, Savior, and faith in Christ. And that is, if I do, you fill in the blank. 
God will like me. God will love me. I'll find favor in God's eyes. That's where the Pharisees were. Everything was about keeping the law. The Bible said Jesus called them whited sepulchers, beautiful tombstones, beautiful coffins on the outside, but the inside was death, dead man's bones, refuse and excess. It was disgusting. But all on the outside, they made it look great. What was it? It was an outward form with no substance. There was nothing real. Don't you hate getting a chocolate bunny that's hollow? Man, I'm always upset about that. That's what they had. I don't know how we got the chocolate bunnies on that, but that's what they had. It was hollow. It was empty. There was nothing to it. Oh, Lord, help us. He's Lord of the Sabbath. They fell into this trap. Not to mention, they had added all kinds of rules and traditions on top of God's law. Think of it. They, they did what unregenerate man typically does with power. And we're seeing this with mayors and governors right now, aren't we? What does unre- unregenerate man do with power? They abuse it. They go to where it's ridiculous. That's what they've done. Let me just give you a couple examples. For example, Exodus 16, 29 tells us that you cannot travel on the Sabbath day. Well, the natural question, what is considered traveling? <laughs> Can I go around my house some? Can I go to someone else's house? Can I go a little bit further than that? Right? These are the questions they would get. So, this is what they came up with. You could go 3,000 feet. Let me get it right before I say it the wrong way. Uh, 3,000. I wrote it down so I wouldn't have to remember it. Right. 3,000 feet. Unless you have some food. If you have some food, it's an extension then of your house. So you could go 3,000 more feet. If you went any further than that, it was sin. (laughs) <laughs> now, where did they get that from Exodus 16, 29? I have no idea, but that was the way they viewed it. How about Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11, and also in Jeremiah 17, 21, 22? You cannot carry any burden or any load on the Sabbath day. So the natural question they ask is, well, what constitutes a load? Again, they're missing the whole spirit of the law. The spirit is God wants you to rest. You're following God's example of creation. This is not our Sabbath. Sunday is not our Sabbath. We are not following God's example and rejoicing and taking rest from his work from creation on the seventh day. We are celebrating God's wonderful redemption salvation plan with the rising from the grave on the first day of the week. So this, we're not on the Christian Sabbath. But just understand the Jewish mind a little bit. The point was take a break. You need rest and the time to rest your soul in the Lord and focus on your God. A time to rest your body from the weary week of work. And they've made it this type of thing. What can we do but not be sin? It's like what they did with the parents thing, you know. Uh, They would neglect their parents and they would say, oh, no, this is all a gift of God. So I don't give it to my parents because it's been dedicated to God. And their parents are going hungry. But these children, I mean, just all kinds of things like that. And yet they thought God would accept that because of their tradition, their rules. Missing the whole spirit of God, the whole spirit of what the Lord. That's what we see here. Here's another one. Oh, they talk about your, your clothes. Yeah, constitutes a, does that constitute a load? Your clothes. Pharisees said it's fine if you're wearing them. Hallelujah, right? Uh, but not if you're carrying them. So you could wear a jacket, but you couldn't take your jacket off and carry it. That'd be a load. It'd be a sin. But one scholar wrote this. Tailors didn't carry a needle with them on the Sabbath for fear they'd see someone's hole or something and mend it on the Sabbath day. Uh, nothing could be bought or sold. Clothing could not be dyed or washed. A letter could not be dispatched, even if by hand of a Gentile. No fire could be lit or extinguished, including fire for a lamp. Although a fire already lit could be used within certain limits. For that reason, even today, Orthodox Jews will have a timer at their house that turns all their lights on before 6 o'clock on Friday night for their Sabbath, because their day begins at 6 in the evening, Friday at 6 o'clock, Sabbath till Saturday at 6, right? And so they'll turn all their lights on automatically so they don't forget and have to be all evening in the dark because they can't flip the light switch. And that's their, that's their Orthodox Jew rules. And so uh, baths could not be taken for fear some water might spill on the floor and wash it. Uh, chairs could not be moved because dragging them might make a furrow in the ground. And a woman was not allowed to, you girls, would, ladies would hate this. A woman would not be allowed to look in the mirror for fear she'd see a gray hair and be tempted to pull it out. That was the truth. Think of that. So here we have verses 1 and 2. We have this 
hair splitting type of regulation, no pun intended there. But look at verse one. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck to eat the corn. Verse two. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said, behold, thy disciples do that, which is not lawful doing Sabbath day. Well, their law actually said you could do that if you were starving. I'm starving right now. <laughs> what constitutes starving, right? There's the next question. Again, you see it just gets no end to it. Let me ask you, why were the disciples doing this? Why were they pulling off the grains of wheat and eating it? They were hungry. Let me ask you, why were they hungry? They are following the Lord. Here's another example of the poverty that they bore. Remember what Jesus said? Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. That's interesting, isn't it? They were hungry. They were following the God. It's a reminder of a poverty our Lord bare. This is exactly the kind of approach, though, to God that Jesus had dealt with in the Sermon on the Mount. And the reason Jesus was calling them, hey, there's hope in the yoke. Remember the last time we preached here? There's hope in the yoke. You get in the yoke. They've, they've piled all these burdens on you of my law, and, and they've mis, misinterpreted it. They've misread it. Get in the yoke with me. My burden is easy. It's light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And so here, here's exactly what, they're, what he's preaching. They're burdened with the Pharisees' tradition. The law had been heaped on them. I love verse 3. But he said to them, have ye not read? <laughs> here he's talking to the Pharisees, the, the religious people that knew the law, right? Have you guys not read in the Bible? Have you all read that? <laughs> the Lord had some humor to him, all right? And Jesus asked the question. By the way, he asked that question on six different occasions. Six times. And every time he was referring to six different books of the Old Testament. Now, this is interesting to me. Again, I love the Lord's confidence in the Word of God. The Lord Jesus is confident. It's, it's, it's a significant illustration of God's attitude. The Lord Jesus Christ's attitude uh, to the Bible. He believed it. You say, well, the Old Testament, we just look at it. No, no. Jesus believed it. He quoted it. He knew it. He knew every word. He, he, he quoted it as authoritative. He appealed to it without hesitation. Think of that. He knew it perfectly. He put his divine stamp of approval on the word of God. I love it. In all its parts. Listen, those who detract from the word of God are strangers to Christ. Think of that. Because Christ believed the Bible. Every jot, every tittle. He believed it all. Lord, help us to make more of your word. Oh, help us. Look at verses, uh, keep reading after th verse 3. Have you not read what David did when he was hungered, and they that were with him, how he entered in the house of God, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests? Verse 5. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Jesus here is pointing out God's attitude toward the Sabbath and how exceptions were allowed. David, the man after God's own heart, they did go in. They did take that showbread. And God's judgment didn't come, on, come down. God allowed mercy there. God allowed an exception there. And so there were exceptions allowed by the Lord even in the Old Testament. He's giving them some examples, which is interesting, which would have been contrary to their law. Mark, the same place in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, 28, it says this. He said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. It's the same passage in, in Matthew, or in Mark, yeah. In other words, the Pharisees' rules, it wouldn't even stand up with Old Testament precedent. He says, here's some examples of the Old Testament that's against what your, your rules and traditions are. They missed the heart of the law. That's what they missed. They, they wanted to hold to every letter, but they missed the heart of it. And we see this clearly in the Pharisees' response to Jesus here. Healing a man. With the withered hand on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees were angry about it. They believed and enforced a rule. It's only, and that's just the rule about it, honestly. It was only lawful to heal on the Sabbath if someone's life was on the line. You withered hand people come back a different day. I mean, that's, that, was their, that was their spirit about it. Only if their life was on the line, and that wasn't the case here. Verse 10, we see... Behold, there's a man which is his hand withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? Keep reading, that they might accuse him. You see their motive. You see their spirit. They didn't come uh, to the synagogue here to learn about God or 
to enjoy being with God's people or to worship God. They came to find fault. Here they come asking a question of the Lord so they could accuse him. And we know by the end here in a few verses, so they could destroy him. That was their spirit. Think of that. They care nothing about this man. Who cares about him? He's a pawn. In fact, some Bible scholars think this could have been even a trap. They purposely planted this man there and said, Hey, Lord, here, is it lawful to heal this guy right here? That's interesting. If that's the case, it tells two things about these Pharisees. First of all, it tells uh, some important truths. But if they, spent, if they set this trap on purpose, number one, they believed Jesus could heal them. They knew he had the power of God on his life to heal the sick. Remember, never did Jesus' enemies question if he could heal or that he had healed. Never. You have to be 2,000 years removed at some university in a musty library to question if Jesus actually healed people. Because none of the enemies of Jesus ever thought he didn't heal anybody. They, they would question the power. They would say, you're doing it by Beelzebub, by the power of the devil. But never did they question if they healed someone. You know why? Like I've already said, thousands of people were walking around with withered hands that were healed, with lame legs that were walking, with demon possession that were not, even dead that were raised to life. There were thousands. You say, how do you know that? Well, we've pointed out through Matthew all this time, he healed them all. The whole city came. He healed everyone. Read verse 15. Look at the last part. What's it say? Great multitudes came, and what did he do? Healed them all. So there's no way. So even by, if this was a plant, if it was a trap on purpose, they were admitting this guy had power from God. Now, they would try to change it. Oh, say it's power from the devil. We've already dealt with that. But certainly, or well, we're going to deal with that later in this chapter at a different time. But anyway, they would admit that. Number two, they would acknowledge that Jesus was a compassionate Savior. He was one that if faced with somebody, he had to help them. Don't you love that spirit? Hey, it doesn't matter who you are. You may think you're insignificant. Jesus is looking at you. Jesus is interested in you. Jesus cannot pass up somebody that has a need. He's compassionate. That doesn't mean we need to give money to everybody. I'm, not in the, I'm saying to help people. Money doesn't help people, okay? But love, care, concern. Introduce them to the one that will meet all the need. Be a friend that will last for eternity, the Lord Jesus. He loved people. Of course, Jesus traps them at their own game. Look at verse 11 and 12. And he said to them, What man should there be among you that have a sheep if it fall in the pit on the Sabbath day? Will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Of course, they knew the answer. Yeah, we've done that. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath day? Imagine the intensity of the look the Lord hears. He looks on them. Verse 13, then saith he to the man. So he looks at these people that are saying this awful thing. He looks at Mark 2 says it this way. He looked round about on them with anger. Why? Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. I don't know your heart condition. Only the Lord knows this morning. But God is grieved and we're hardened, hearted people. Our hearts are hard. Again, a question Will your heart be humbled or hardened by this king? We see the hardness of these people. Their heart is so hard. Jesus heals the man. In response, the Pharisees go out conspiring to kill him. What an unbelievable picture here we have as the ones most devoted to the law turn completely on the one who wrote the law, the Lord Jesus Christ, God. Verses 6 through 8. Don't miss the underlying point here. He says, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if he had known what this meaneth, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice, he would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. See, Jesus is making clear that he's Lord. I'm Lord of the Sabbath day. I am God. He is God in the flesh, and he is uh, God Almighty. He is the Almighty One. He has all power. Verse 7 was absolutely right. It was absolutely right for Jesus to show mercy here. He's quoting from Hosea. God desires mercy rather than sacrifice. Where is your mercy here? Jesus is clearly saying that the way to become right before God is not through following certain rules or going through some religious ritual. The way to be right before God is by trusting in the Lord Jesus. It's through faith in Him. 
That's the way to be right with God. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come of the Father but by me. You come to God not by keeping rules. You come to God by faith and trust in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, if you're here and don't know Christ as Savior, you'll never be able to keep it. You'll never, you'll never, well, I've got to quit my alcohol for it. You'll never do it. You don't have the strength to do that. The Lord is our strength. You need the physician before you're going to get better. And so come to Jesus. Come to Him and get the help that is, is available. He says, come to me. Come to me. I'll give you rest. Rest from what? Rest from your guilt. Rest from your trying and never able to get past that habit or whatever. I'll give you rest to that. I've got the power to help. Come and find grace to help in time of need. See, this is the same message we proclaim today to every single person on the planet. You, you cannot become right with God by following certain rules or traditions of any religion. Only by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. I love verse 21, the very end that we read. In His, in his name, Acts would say, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Verse 21, and in His name shall the Gentiles trust. He's quoting the prophet Isaiah prophesying of Jesus. His name. It's only by trusting the Lord Jesus. This, what the Pharisees are pushing, this is true legalism. People sometimes want to throw that word around in our day. Oh, you all are legalists. People that try to live according to the Bible. And, and if they have any type of, of, of belief that God expects us to take the high road. And God calls us to godliness and holiness. Be ye holy for I am holy. Oh, you're a legalist. You'd say it's wrong to... No, God says it's wrong. He says, be holy like me. And if you want to walk with God in the light, you can't do the things of darkness, right? But people want to use that term legalism. Legalism has nothing to do with that. Legalism is people setting standards to be saved, standards to be right with God. See, for a believer, we don't do what we do in order to get God to like us. In order to get God's favor on our life, we live a life because of. Because God saved me, because He took all my sin, because I was filthy and deserved hell, and He picked me up out of that miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings, because of that, I want to be a good representation of my Father. I want to be a good child of my Heavenly Father. I don't want to represent Him poorly. And that's why I have certain standards and rules in my life. I'm not going to live like a world and act like a child of the devil and claim to be a child of God. That's why I'm going to be faithful to church. You legalists, you got to go to church. No, I go to church because I love God. I want to be around God's people. I want to be obedient to my heavenly Father who saved me. So this, but this here of the Pharisees, now this is true legalism. This is what they're pushing. I would even submit to you that Jesus Christ deliberately broke their rules and traditions of the Sabbath. He was trying to break up their form and show them, hey guys, look inside here. It's empty. You see it? There's nothing here. It's, it's a shadow and mirrors. There's nothing to this. You don't even know God. He's trying to show them. See, Jesus wanted to see Pharisees saved too. He's going to reach some. He was even patient with them. They were even part of this flax that was smoking. They were part of this reeds that he were bruised. And he would reach some. Nicodemus would come to him. Joseph of Arimathea. See, God would reach some, and I'm sure many others we didn't know about. He had taught that mere external of them would make them one bit holy. True righteousness had to come from the heart. The Hebrew word is interesting, sabbat, or shabbat, as they might would say it, uh, means repose. It means rest. You might say, why does Matthew, because he's not following, following chronological order here, why does Matthew bring up Sabbath right here? Well, the end of chapter 11. Hey, y'all, come. Come to me. Find rest. Come to me. I'll give you rest. And then he says, come, find rest. He's talking about rest, and so now he brings up Sabbath, which means rest. That's interesting, isn't it? Which explains why he introduces this conflict over Sabbath right here. Jesus offers rest to all who come to him. But there's no rest in mere, uh, in mere religious observances. There's no rest. No matter how much you go to Mass, no matter how many times you pray in the street or pray somewhere else, it doesn't make any difference. You'll never feel good enough. You'll never make it. You can't do enough good things because Jesus made it. Where we're condemned by our own conscience. You are a sinner and you know it. There's only one balm in Gilead that can heal that. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who is that balm. Only He can wash away. Only He can make it clean. 
Only the Lord Jesus. And so there's no rest in this religious observance. You could climb all the stairs on your knees in some temple. You could do all of it. It's not going to make it. You're not going to feel better about it. Oh, may God help us to come find the rest. Notice verse 9. This is a sad statement. He's in Capernaum. And when he was departed thence, he went into, what's the next word? That's sad. Their synagogue. Not ours. Oh, God help us. They had crowded Christ out of their worship. They had crowded God. God wasn't even welcome at their church. Think of it. There. May God help us never to be about our, what we are doing, our ministry and our, no, no. It's all the Lord's. It's not our work that he enters into. It's his work we have the privilege of entering into. It's all about the Lord Jesus, isn't it? Let me ask you, we see the accusation of the hungered here and the accusation of healing on the Sabbath day. I've got to ask this question. Did Jesus break the law? Look at verse 2. Pharisees answered the question. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not, what? Not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But the Lord Jesus would say he would keep every jot. He would keep every tittle. He had not come to remove the law. He came to fulfill the law. Everything. Completely. He never once in thought, never once in word, never once in deed did he break the law of God. Not once. Not a single commandment in letter or in spirit. Not at all. So evidently this is not a violation. What the disciples did or what Jesus did. The problem was not that they were breaking the Sabbath. They were breaking the rules and regulations and traditions of the Sabbath that they had added on here. They elevated their traditions above the Word of God. You don't have to look far to see that even in our day. Where we've taken and elevated traditions of form of religion over what the Bible says. Above God and the Spirit of His Word. The rabbis had made the Sabbath a burden instead of a blessing. There's people that do that with the Lord Jesus. It's a burden to try to follow all these things rather than it be a blessing. He is not a burden. Get in the yoke with Jesus. His burden is light. You can't miss with the Lord. You get in the burden with Him, He carries the load. You're casting all your cares upon Him. Just throw it on the other side. He'll carry it. Get in, the bur- get, in the, get in the yoke with Him. Guess what? He always does that which pleases the Father. You don't have to worry about making a wrong turn. Just get in the yoke with Him. You don't have to make another decision. That's where it gets heavy. Some of you have laid up at night. What do I do? My son. What do I do? My daughter. What do I do? My brother. My husband. My wife. What do I do? And the decision. What do I do with this job offer? What do I do? What a blessing to get in the yoke where Jesus is going to guide. Hey, you're a sheep. You ain't made for, excuse me, you weren't made for making decisions. God gave you a shepherd. Hallelujah. And the shepherd makes the decisions. We just follow. He said, you'll hear the spirit behind you saying, turn to the right hand, turn to the left hand. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Oh, what a privilege God's given us. What a release. What a relief. Oh, would you like to know Jesus' answer if he broke the law? Look at verse 6. But I say unto you, this is the place, and when, this, that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have, what? Condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Condemn the guiltless. That was God's word on it. See, at this point, I believe the Pharisees' minds are blown. On top of that, they're seething with anger. And they just, I just, we've got to destroy this guy. And they don't have any logical words to exit out of their mouth any further. But in the synagogue, Jesus points out here as they come in and he heals the man. And now that they're in the synagogue, he points out, you would help your sheep. Your sheep. Here's one of my sheep. I own this man. God owns everything, doesn't he? He's the only owner, right? He owns the whole world. He owns it all. This man is his sheep. He's of great worth in the sight of the Savior. And Jesus says he's infinitely more valuable than his sheep. He's infinitely more valuable than all the sparrows and even them I see when they fall. Pharisees didn't care. See, Jesus cared for the individual. Jesus is looking, like I said, he's looking at you. 
He's a personal Savior. Number two, the last thing we'll be through, Jesus Christ is not only Lord of the Sabbath, the second picture, Jesus Christ is the servant of God and sinners. Look at verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence. Isn't that a sad thing? Here's people causing Jesus to withdraw from their loved ones, their family, their friends, themselves. Hey, wouldn't it be a sad thing today to leave here and Jesus is actually, had, rather than you drawing closer, remember, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. But because you have resisted, he actually withdraws from you. Now, he'll never leave you, forsake you if you know him as Savior. I understand that. But you know his near presence, don't you? When God is active in your life and people can see the hand of the Lord working on you and you know when that's not been the way. Wouldn't it be sad? Here, they, he withdraws from them. He withdrew. But look at the ones. And, I love it, great multitudes followed him. Come unto me. Whoever's interested, whoever loves me, whoever wants rest. And he healed them all and charged them that they should not make them known. See, Jesus didn't fight. He just withdraws here. He, he, why? His hour has not yet come. He, he wasn't going to die in Capernaum. And he wasn't going to die by the hand of the Pharisees because they would have killed him by stoning. That was their way. They wouldn't have crucified him. And we know he was going to fulfill what the Bible said. He was going to be crucified, wasn't he? I, I love the end of verse 15. He healed them all. Come to Jesus today, friend. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what the wound is. It doesn't matter what the problem. He knows the answer. He'll heal you. You say, I'm, I'm lost. Come, he'll save you. You said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm backslidden. Hey, he'll help you. Come back to him. There's mercy. There's grace to be found. Come to him. He receives all. Verse 17, as we see this Old Testament quote in Matthew, the longest Old Testament quote in Matthew, that it might be fulfilled, again, that wonderful fulfilling of the Lord Jesus of all the Old Testament, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant. Oh, I love that phrase. Let's do that for a minute. Behold, behold my servant. Just look at Jesus a minute. Behold him. Behold my servant. Wow. Behold my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. Oh, get in the yoke with him. Jesus always pleases the Father. I'll put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Wow. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Stop there just for a minute. See, first Jesus is loved by the Father, and he's filled with the Spirit. Uh, Jesus alone is pleasing before the Father. You want to please the Father, you can't do it. Unless Jesus. You, you can't please the Father, I can't please the Father. Only Jesus does. So as I die to self... Now what Paul said, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And as that happens now, I have the ability to please the Father. Not only that, He alone is perfect and fully under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, do I dare say it again? Get in the yoke with the Lord. I can't do it without Him. Second, we see here Jesus is a friend to sinners. Not only is the one that pleases the Father, behold my servant. Here's the one that's a servant of God. That's what Isaiah called him, prophesying of Jesus. But he's a friend to sinners and he serves sinners. Jesus is hope for the hurting. He's a meek and gentle Savior. Jesus refused to fight with the Pharisees. You'll not hear him shouting. That's what verse 19 is talking about. You're not going to hear him shouting in the street and fighting with the Pharisees. He wasn't going to fight with them. He said, I'll, I'll find those that are not well. Let me go to the sick. Let me go to the ones that are hurting, the sinners. Let me go to the weak and in need. Oh, what imagery, verse 20, a bruised reed shall he not break. And smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. I see, a reed is weak already. It's a, it's a hollow a reed. It's already weak. Now it's been bruised. It's not even going to stand anymore. Jesus, rather than harming or damaging that, even that bruised reed, he binds it. It literally is the picture of weakened, weakness, weakened. That's what a bruised reed is. A reed is already weak. You're not going to use a reed for anything. You're not going to build anything with a reed. You're not going to do much with a reed. It's already weak. And he's saying, mankind, you and me, you're so weak. 
And now you've been bruised by sin, you're diseased. And yet, in your weakened weakness, he says, I'll help you. In your weakness, weakened, he says, I'll, I'll bind you up. I'll come to you. I won't damage, I won't hurt. He's gentle. He's a gentle Savior. Rather, he turns to the sick, the sinner, the weak, the in need. Oh, it's a fitting picture of the poor people, broken, whom the Lord comforts and heals like you and me. The prophets marvelously foretold of the gentle character of Jesus. He's even patient with the Pharisees. This idea of smoking flax was a wick they would use. And once the wick got bad, it would just smoke and it actually would hurt your eyes as it smoked and stuff. And, and these Pharisees are, it could even be pointing to them. He, he, he's, he's, he's still gentle with them. He doesn't fight them. He doesn't condemn them. He's going to reach some of the Pharisees too. That's amazing, isn't it? Here he withdraws. Nicodemus comes to mind. What imagery for the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath, the one with authority over the law, the promised king. Christ comes to people whose flame is flickering out, who's bruised and broken and battered by sin. He doesn't break them. He binds them up. Christ comes and offers his yoke to the spiritually broken, those so breathed by, bruised by sin and its effects that they're unable to stand up under it. He comes to them. There was a Puritan pastor, Richard Sibbs. He wrote the book, The Bruised Reed. In it he wrote this, Are you bruised? Be of good comfort, he calls you. Conceal not, conceal not your wounds, open all before him, and go to Christ. There's more mercy in him than sin in you. Think of that. There's more mercy in him than sin in you. Where sin did abound, Grace did much more about. His name shall the Gentiles trust. He's pointing to the shift coming in Acts as we see the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul is going to come forward. The wondrous shift of that door of opportunity for the Gentiles, hallelujah, is still open. Come to Christ, his safe. As we conclude, I want to just point out the greater than. I won't preach it. I'll say it for another time. But if you'll study out verse 6, he's greater than the temple. The temple was a sacred place to them. They almost worshiped the temple rather than the God of the temple. Verse 8, he's Lord and greater than the Sabbath. Verse number 41, we're going to find as we study there, he's greater than the prophet, Jonas. Think of this, our prophet, priest, and king. He's greater than, not only that, King Solomon. Verse uh, 42, pretty amazing. We have our, a prophet, priest, and king in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's greater than all. So the question remains, will your heart be humbled or hardened by this king? Hey, hey, it's not an easy road, the discipleship road. Oh, it's a wonderful road. He says, a yoke sounds like work. Oh, God's called us. We'll work till Jesus comes. But I'll tell you, with Jesus, you'll never regret you got in the yoke with him. They had to accept or reject him. We see people hardened by him. It's impossible to be neutral. Hey, there's no middle ground. He is still a controversial person still today. The enemy's still after him. You're going to stand before him one day. You're either going to be his friend or his enemy. He will either be your savior or your judge. You cannot get rid of Jesus Christ. Will your heart be hardened or humbled by him? Let's bow in prayer, may we?